Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Trasna Natira this evening. Uh, this evening, we're joined by Professor John Breslin, who is, uh, along with Sarah Ann Buckley, co-author of a book called Old Ireland in Colour, which is taking the bookshelves by storm, shall we say, this Christmas. Uh, he's, uh, the book is recent winner of the best Irish published book of the year, 2020. And uh, John, we're delighted to have you with us this evening. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, everyone. Delighted to be here as well. So, um, yeah, so um, I'll give a, just some background to myself. So I'm a academic in NUI Galway. Um, I've been working in the university for about 20 years. Um, my main kind of areas are engineering. Uh, I teach in engineering. Um, I've also taught computing topics and entrepreneurship. And I have a, a presentation which I'm going to share with you to give some background to the Old Ireland Colour Project. As I was just saying before we, we, we started recording, it's it's about a year old, but actually the, the story is um, is still relevant, although a lot of things have happened, I suppose, even in, in, in the past year, not least with, with the world, but also in terms of, of, um, of ourselves and, and the project. So let me share this with you now so you can see. And I'm very happy to take questions at any stage. Uh, NUI Galway, which is um, university in the west of Ireland, is the university, just to answer the question there in the chat. And OK, so hopefully you can see this in a second. There we go. So everyone can see those slides OK? Yeah, that's perfect, John. Great. OK, so. Um, So I gave this presentation internally to our research institute. And I was trying to explain to, uh, I, I work in a, in, in a research institute that is very multinational. There is like, I think about 30 different countries from around the world represented in the institute. And I was explaining to the people that for people outside of Ireland, they probably haven't heard of Peg Sayers, who of course is a well-known Irish author, well-known to many Irish people in terms of, of her book that we, many of us would have studied in school. Um, however, uh, most, uh, as, as we might, say millennials may not know of her or certainly would have studied her in school um and um you know for many i suppose all they would have had of of peg would have been that book which many thought was quite a, a sad or mournful memoir and some black and white photographs so um about a year and a half ago I was carrying out some family genealogy. And uh, as part of that, you gather various records. You know, I, I, I started to, you know, look at birth records, marriage records, baptismal records, um, and try to build a whole family tree. And as part of that, I found, uh, you know, I had some black and white photographs, but I found some older black and white photographs that I thought it would be great to see in color. So I started using Photoshop to try and colorize some of these photographs. And it was taking me ages to do it. And um, then around the same time, I found out about a new artificial intelligence system, which could be used to automatically colorize old black and white photographs. So I suppose bear in mind that um, this presentation is a year ago. And actually, the system that I, I use quite a lot is called the Oldify. It was created by a guy called Jason Antic, who's a engineer and researcher based in California. And essentially, essentially, it learns from a large bank of color photographs and the corresponding black and white photographs. And then it knows for various shapes and textures how to map a, uh, a, an estimate of, of a particular color to a particular shape or texture in an unknown black and white image. And um, so I tried this out anyway on, on the photograph of my grandmother initially. And you know, it did in a number of seconds what I'd been trying to do in in hours, um, and it gets you to a certain level. You know, it's it's not perfect. You'll see various inconsistencies, and you know, um, critics may point out to you know various issues, or you know, many people may just prefer the black and white photograph. But for me, it was it was a good way to try and bring the black and white photograph of my grandmother to color. And then I started experimenting with other images, like the ones of Peg on on the previous slide. So this is a, a, a an image of of uh, of Peg in color. Um, an image of, of, of. We might have to mute some of the other mics there. There's a bit of feedback. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear that. Um, now this one, I don't know if it'll actually. No, I was going to say it might actually animate because um, this is a actually an animated ver version of of a Peg picture, which doesn't. I don't seem to be able to get to animate here. But anyway, basically, 
it moves or morphs between, between two, two images. Um, so not only can you use these various frameworks to colorize images, but you can actually use them to, you know, um, I suppose, bring more life to them in different ways. And one of them is to create small animations. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I suppose in, in, in the olden days, there were many photographs taken uh, in stereo, which we call stereographs or stereo cards. And oh, there we go, my, my screen is giving an error. Can you still see the slides there? No, just as beard. Yeah, we can. Uh, we just yeah. can't see it in full screen, John. Okay. Yeah, it's back yeah. there now. <laughs> Never seen that before. Gave a, a Google Drive error. Anyway, um, so they, they used to have these stereo cards or stereographs in the olden days where basically you would have an image taken at the same time in the left and the right. And there was a special stereograph or stereo card viewer to view these uh, cards. These were, you know, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And uh, you can now actually take those images and you can basically create almost a, a 3D or an animated version of those as well using various AI technologies. Anyway, this is uh, one of the earlier images I would have done of, of Peg. And oh yeah, uh, I'll tell you what the reason for that is. Um, we, have, uh, <laughs> we have YouTube blocked here at home to stop the kids from overdosing on YouTube. So that's why I couldn't click through to that video. Um, so here's a, a, an array of, of, uh, of images of Peg, which I would have colorized um, last year. And these are all from the National Folklore Collection, which would have been taken under the auspices of the Irish Folklore Commission in the early 20th century. Um, and here again is another batch of images of, of Oscar Wilde. Again, these are from another source. They're from the Library of Congress in the United States. And you know, Oscar Wilde toured to the US in, um, I think it was 1888. And these, cap these were captured by a famous photographer called um, Napoleon Cerrone at the time of that tour. Um, now, it's not just photos that you can do, you can basically do all the five video too. And we have a YouTube channel for Old Ireland and Colour where you can see some examples of, of various colorizations carried out using, uh, using the system as well. So, as I said to you, you know, Deodify was created by Jason Antic. He uh, has um, since then uh, gone commercial. He uh, has a company, Deodify, with the other person shown here, which is Dana Kelly. And I met Dana and Jason last summer when I was in the States for a meeting and we had a great chat about all things colorization. Now, I don't want to get too technical in terms of how it works. It uses a, a system called generative adversarial networks, where when the colorization is initially done, there is a system that's called critic that basically criticizes the colorizations and then teaches the system to make better images. Um, okay, this keeps crashing out, but anyway, here we are back in. Hopefully you can see this again. Um, so yeah, I, as I said, you know, it was basically some family research that I was doing. Uh, there's an article online you can look up from Donegal uh, Live, which is about basically that kind of journey. My, my family are from uh, County Clare and from County Donegal. And this is an article from a Donegal newspaper that describes the, the route to this. So some favorite images, and again, as I say, these are a year old. So the, actually the versions that are in the new book are quite a bit more advanced than this in terms of, I would say, realistic colorizations. For example, I often say in, 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 um, in various interviews and so on that, you know, uh, one of the things was to make sure that Tom Crean's jumper was anything but lilac. And I can see the lilac here, which I would have, again, you know, um, manually colorized after this initial colorization. So, um, and actually even just, I found that this is a nice image to talk about. I found that this particular image of, of Crean and Edgar Evans is shown on his right hand side here. You could really notice a lot of the details in the background that you know you didn't really see before in the black and white image, uh, or at least I didn't see. Um, for example, there is um, up here uh, behind the hand here you can see so the hand that's holding the the, the, the needle and thread. It says Gonzalez Bias Oporto. So it's actually um, a, a box of sherry, and then you've got Fry's Pure Concentrated Cocoa. Up on the top there. Can you see me moving my mouse as I move around the screen? Yeah. Yeah, we can, John. Yeah. I'm nearly sorry. Yeah. Um, you can see a box of Marcella cigars behind Tom Crean there. I found actually a, a similar box on eBay. So I was able to see or get the correct colors for that later on. And you can see his pipe, his trademark pipe actually sitting behind him on the seat. And then lots of other things like, um, you know, short party boxes and so on, and some uh, refined sugar up in, in, in the top there. The picture on the left is from. Um, a photographer called uh, Mary Alice Young, who is from Galgorn Castle in Northern Ireland. And this is a, a lovely kind of Vermeer 
influence photograph um, of uh, of a woman baking. And again, on the on the box in the background, you can read read McFarlane and Lang um, dinner wafers. They were a Scottish biscuit um, company. So some more uh, nice picture from 1902 of a car. We've got Ma gone. We've got Yates. We have uh, JFK visiting Galway. We have uh, a famous uh, computer scientist from Donegal, um, Kay McNulty, shown here in the University of Pennsylvania. She was one of the first computer programmers in the world. She programmed the ENIAC, which is the first programmable computer. Uh, she was from Creasloch in Donegal. We have Bram Stoker, Oscar Wilde, um, some connections to NUI Galway, the Stoney. So George Johnson Stoney was the person who invented the term electron, and he was a professor at at uh, Queen's College Galway, and he also was the head of the Irish States Exams Board. So, you know, I suppose the other thing I should say is I'm not um, a historian by background. In fact, I'm learning a lot as I go along here. And, you know, I often tell people in, in the articles that my, my last formal brush with history was in 19, 1988 when I did my, um, my junior cert, uh, the insert as it was then. And, um, but you know, this, I suppose, process of, of colorizing photographs has been a real eye, op eye opener for me in terms of the stories behind all these photographs, whether it's, you know, people like um, Kay McNulty or Stoney or whoever. Um, these are a couple more animations. We have the famous um, uh, lunch on a skyscraper picture, which apparently has two men from Galway. This guy on the, chap here, on the right here, he's, he's a guy called uh, Wynn from a photographer from Mayo, um, showing some of his wares there. Bunch of pictures from around uh, Ireland, from from Donegal, from Galway, from Waterford. Um, so you can see some of these pictures you might recognize from the old Ireland Colour social media channels and some from the book as well, but some other ones here that we would have shared last year. Um, so just a kind of a range of some interesting photographs there. This one down here, I think it's the grandfather or great grandfather of Kino Kivan, the, uh, the writing of to DJ. We have Tomasa Crahan here. Um, these are actually the, on top left. It's um, some former neighbors of mine in Fenora and County Clare. And the big tall man here, he used to be my next door neighbor. So I, I found that in the National Folklore Collection. Um, just it's it's funny the connections you find across different photographs. Top right is Walt Disney visiting in Kerry, and the one in the middle there, which has been improved quite a bit since then, is the picture on the cover of the old Ireland color book. So. You know, the, the software gets you so far, I suppose, but often you have to do some manual colorization afterwards. And there's a lot more to talk about in terms of correct colorization, but for now, just in terms of something that um, involves even just simple things like hands and faces. So on the right hand side here, you can basically see uh, this picture is from Guidor. So it's, you know, around, I think it's around 1880, 1890. Um, but you can see on the right hand side, a lot of the manual colorization of faces, hands, and so on that I would have done. And this particular photograph, a lot of people are holding their hands together. They were knitting or, or uh, they were basically told probably to hold their hands still for the photograph because of the, the long exposure time. So you can see all these little hands on, on, on the right hand side in that kind of position. So this is an example of some of the colorizations. This, this is just one layer, I suppose, that you have to manually do on top of the AI um, output that you get. And uh, just to make it look, uh, look look better and look a bit more real. Of course, the you know the AI systems don't always give you the the right color first time. This is a, a, a nice example of the Gold Gate Bridge, which of course didn't come out golden at all. It came out quite white and silver. Um, but of course, uh, there's lots of approaches to try and tackle that through research, through improving the systems, and so on. Um, I won't go too much into this, but basically I have a machine here beside me in the office that I, I use for mass colorization. And just to give you an idea, idea, I suppose, of how feasible this is, I took all of the images from the National Library of Ireland's Flickr page and all of the images from uh, Goy Library, from the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and from the National Folklore Collection. And I ran them through the system. And you can do an initial AI-based colorization of a lot of images in you know, relatively small amount of time. So like we're talking maybe a second or two for each image if we're running on a, a very high power computer. So basically all of those, what are this 11 and tree and tree and tree, you know, about 20,000 images there would have been done maybe in probably a day or two. Um, but as I say, that gets you so far. Things like, you know, the sky and fields and so on, they usually come up pretty well, but it's when you get down to people, the clothes, um, other details in the photographs that that takes a lot of time to basically manually update and and uh, and, and enhance. 
Um, so yeah, lots of social media followers. I'm going to skip through this because the information is, is out of date. So a bit about the historical accuracy and, you know, I guess this is a question we, we, we were often asked in terms of how do you figure out what the right colors are for things. So it's a combination of things. So today I shared out a picture of, um, of Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, which um, I colorized over the past few days. And it's from 1866 it's, or 1865 actually. It's taken from um, an album of photographs uh, in what was called the Thomas Larkin collection. And it's in the, it's, it's held now at the moment in, in the New York public library. So I knew this picture was there and, you know, it, it's, there's, it's, it, it's a prison photograph, prison shot, uh, face on. I'll show you actually, cause I can share this with you instead. So we're already talking about something in the abstract. I'll show you on the social media channel. So here's a picture. Uh, sorry, you, you don't see that. Here's not the picture. Um, here is the picture of um of O'Donovan Rasa. So, you know, I suppose in terms of detail, there's not a, a, a lot that you have to fix here because you know, apart from the face, but there are obvious things in terms of hair color, in terms of eyes, and in terms of clothing. So, you know, you're 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 making, I suppose, uh, a best guess in terms of what you know what, what color would the sign have been? You know, is it probably white written on black would be probably a good guess. There's some kind of you know rough spun uh clothing brown would be um a, a good guess for the time there are records of um of o'donovan's clear blue eyes which makes it easy in terms of the eye color so you can get to a certain stage in terms of of the research for a particular photograph and you know i, I did another one today which um is of uh, james craig the first northern ireland prime minister and again just in terms of uh eye color and hair color and so on. Uh, the first thing I looked at was for portraits or paintings that would have been painted of him in person. And again, you get a fair idea of you know what color eyes and, and hair and so on he would have had. So you know you're looking for those kind of uh, cues in terms of what color things should be. And you know it, it'll never be 100% accurate. In fact, you'd be lucky if you got any large number of accuracy. But you're trying to get something that that is as good as you can do and you know brings it to life somewhat. Um, so back to Back to this. So, as I say, yeah, you, you do some manual touch up or adjustment afterwards, and you know there are various techniques you can use in terms of Photoshop and so on to to basically um, to touch up these systems. Um, so, if there's any records of clothes types or of traditions or of you know statistical information in terms of common eye colors, you try and use those to add some balance to various parts of the picture. So here's an example of Countess Markovic, you know the black and white picture an initial AI-based colorization. And then, then, of course, we know that she would have worn the bottle green uh, uniform typical of, of, the, of the ICA. Oh, sorry, you can't see this. Resume share. So if any stage uh, slides aren't showing, just give me a shout. Um, so hopefully you can see this now again. And um, you can just nod there, Liam, if you can see it. Yeah, you don't have to unmute. I can, I can, I can see you as yeah. well. Yeah, perfect. Not, not, we don't see it yet, John. You don't see it yet. Okay. No, sorry. Oh, it's, it's, it's sharing is paused. Let me see why that is. Resume share. Okay, let me just reshare it again then. You know, I'm just going to leave it on. Um, I'm just going to leave on this mode because it's big enough and uh, it means I can see everything at the same time. So hopefully, it'll be a bit, bit more, bit more reliable. Anyway, so you can see the picture of of uh, of, uh, of Markovic as I was saying, an initial AI colorization, then fine tuning in terms of you know adding some more information to the to the hands, fixing the gun colors, changing the the clothes to be bottle green and so on. That would be a tip, fairly typical um, bit of process. Here's one of Amelia Earhart. As it happened, I'd actually been in the uh, Smithsonian Museum last year, and I'd seen this plane in person. Um, that's her little red bus, as she called it. And um, uh, it's a lot more vibrant color of red, but because of the color of the picture and the darkness, uh, I had to, I suppose, modulate it a bit to make it um, a bit more realistic looking. And uh, you can see the kind of various gold stripes in there. So you're looking for photographs, I suppose, of of perhaps something like maybe like a uniform, or in this case, of course, they're, they're, the, the actual plane itself does exist. So you can use that 
Um, here's another common example, which is the Titanic. And again, there will be various records of, of the colors used there. So we would know from, um, from different things in terms of what color the flag should be. You know, there was actually a bit of debate recently about the flag um, because it's, it's, it's what's called a blue ensign or blue ensign. And um, somebody was questioning, well, I think the blue ensign was only used for military ships. And apparently Titanic was one of the few boats that was allowed to fly a, a blue ensign. So I um, had to kind of validate that and just uh, confirm that I was correct. So you have the you know, orange chimneys and so on, uh, as, as you would see. Um, so I'll skip past these technical links and uh, that's actually it. So yeah, I'm happy to kind of, you know, go through some photographs from, um, from, the, from the project or answer any questions along the way. Um, so yeah, I can, maybe I can kind of start with some of the more recent photographs to tell you stories behind any of them. If that helps, uh, can you see, let's see, I'm sharing, sharing the wrong one now. Let me just share this one instead. And I see some messages in the chat here. Is this done through Jupyter Network? Okay. So um, yeah, so I'll answer that. I'll answer the questions first, and and uh, and, and come back to this. So the Oldify, which is the the AI system, is is it actually comes in different flavors. There's one which is done through a, a system called Google Colab or Jupyter Network, as 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 Aaron is saying there. And that's a free version. And I've I've done a tutorial, and I'll just share my screen with you again so I can um, show you these links on on the fly as well. No, that wasn't what I wanted. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. So I've done a tutorial, and I, I can't um, show you the tutorial because I said you have blocked YouTube in my house. Um, the Oldify tutorial is the link. So it's. Um, yeah, if, if you Google for the Oldify tutorial anyway, you'll, you'll find it straight away. And that, that tells you how to use the free version of, of the Oldify, um, which you can do in your, in your browser. And um, I'll show you for two seconds how, how it works. But so for the Oldify images, which is one link, it brings you to this notebook, as it's called. And the video shows you how to use it. But basically, there's a, there's a series of steps shown here on the, on the right, and you'll see a little um, square brackets thing that you click on to run the steps. And then at some point, it'll ask you for a link for an image. And you put that into the last box. And then it'll basically give you a colorized version of that. That's a very um, a very free, I was going to say. It, it, it's a very cheap way of, of getting an initial colorization of an image, because this system is free, and anybody can use it. It takes, you know, it takes a while for it to kind of run, and it's doing all kind of stuff here in the background. It's basically creating a virtual computing environment. And then at the very end, it allows you to get an image. So let's say I, I take an image from, I'll take one here from the National Library of Ireland. And I'll picture, take a picture of these two gentlemen here from, and it says it's Tomas McDonough, and somebody else, I haven't seen this one before. So I'm just going to copy this link. And this should be ready in, in a few seconds, actually. So it's a good live demo of how the Oldify works. So as I said, if you go to the Oldify tutorial, you can just Google for that. It'll show you some links, but the links are bit.ly forward slash the Oldify images. I paste this into the chat as well, so you'll have it. Um, so there's a question here. Can you ask me other copyright issues with using the images from the National Library? Okay, so I'll answer that in a second. Anyway, you can see here an initial colorization of this. Now, you know, it's it's definitely not perfect, and I'd have to go into Photoshop if I wanted to use this version and do some enhancement. You can change this thing here called the render factor. If you turn down, I'm going to turn down to 20. It might give me a better version of the image because what that does is it kind of focuses in less on details and gives a kind of a better overall view. So we'll see if that, that makes any difference. Um, so in terms of copyright issues, so I don't know if it's if it's better or not. I think it looks much the same there. But you, you get the idea, I suppose, of, of that initial colorization. Um, so yeah, so are there any copyright issues with using images from the National Library? That's a good question. <laughs> and I know I've learned a lot about uh, copyright in, 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 the past, um, in the past year and a half. So I suppose the easy answer is when you go to the National Library of Ireland's website um, and you go to their catalog, 
the images there are copyright. They have made a selection of images available on what's called our Flickr stream. Flickr is a photo sharing website. And when you click on a particular image like this one here, you'll see on the right hand side, it says no, cop no known copyright restrictions. So, you know, to the best of my knowledge, that means you can use this for, um, for, for, for your own purposes. However, um, for the purposes of the Old Ireland Colour Book, we would have asked the National Library of Ireland for permission to use all of these images, and we would have gone through the regular process in terms of, of, of getting access to those images, which is, involves forms and fees and so on. So, you know, uh, a lot, you, you see a lot of NLI photographs on, on, on social media and, you know, some colorized and are, are not. And as I say, there's a selection here that are labeled as being no known copyright restrictions that you can, uh, that I believe you can use. But I, you know, I think it's, it's courtesy to, if you're using them for some kind of commercial purposes, I would go the commercial route and pay. It's a small fee and, you know, the NLI and other collections like National Folklore Collection provide a very excellent service and I think you should, you should support them. Okay, so that's the kind of answer to that one. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, you, you, you get an idea there and say it's, it's an initial version of the colorizer. Now there is another service, which is a paid one from from the same people who made the Oldify, and it's on a an ancestry website called My Heritage, and it's the same kind of idea. And I'm just going to download this image and show you how it works. But it's a drag and drop system, and uh, you can see now. So I've, I've basically gone to the the NLI website. There's a little download button over here on the right hand side, and then there's a thing that says original. I usually just download that one, and I'm just going to drag and drop it over to this My Heritage website. And it's a paid service, but you get five to 10 copies for free. So five to 10 images, I should say, for free. So you can see it doing its thing. It's obviously easier to use than the uh, notebook I've shown you, but as I say, you have to, you have to pay for it. And you can see a very good um, uh, result there. You know, there's a couple of small things. Obviously, you can touch up scratches and you can fix eye color. So if that's, um, if that's uh, Thomas McDonough, we would have records in terms of, of um, of his eye color and so on. Um, so I'm trying to remember what were they, but if, as far as I remember, they were gray eyes because I remember colorizing him for the um, for the old Ireland color book. So yeah, again, you can see the kind of brownie there. You'll go back and change those to to gray and so on. Um, so that's another system. There's another system then called uh, Colorize Images. Again, it's a paid service. They have a, they have an app for the iPhone and for Android. And um, you know, you, you basically make a small payment there. It's basically a cup of coffee and then you can drag and drop the image over onto that and uh, do it that way as well. So there's a couple of options there in terms of colorizing images to, to start off with. And as I say, they give you a good, uh, a good start. It's as I say, you know, it's, it's fine tuning and enhancing that kind of takes the, the, the majority of the work. So uh, any other questions? I'll just, I can just scroll through some of these images and kind of tell you some of the background to these if you want. I have a question, John. Is, is there any risk that in the colorization process that some mistakes would be made and would become part of our history, a part of that image, that the image would, would change um, and mistakes would be made as part of that, that process of, of colorization? Hmm. Um, there is, you know, the, I, I suppose there, there is, as I said to you, that, you know, there is no um there's no way to know for sure that an image is exactly as it should you know as it would have appeared in color if it was taken in color so we know the technology did not exist at the time to take color photographs for 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 many years and um you know it was only really around 1913 that the kind of the first color photographs started to appear and even then they were in short supply and of course we know it was like 60s and 70s before we started getting color photographs here i suppose i, I would say a couple of things this first is that when you look at an image of um let's say for example donovan rossa from 1866, uh, you know that it wouldn't have been taken color originally. So you know you un you'll understand that you're looking at interpretation of it. The the other photograph here is um, Miles Byrne. So he fought in the 1798 rebellion. You know that there is no possible way these could have been in color. Um, possibly when you get, start getting towards you know the mid 20th century and you know more photographs were, were appearing in color you might then, then you you could start to say well you know was was this in color originally or not 
Um, now, what you'll see on, on the various sites, and this is a kind of a new convention that's happened, and you'll notice this on, on, um, on the, the one I did there on the Oldify site, which I've lost here. But on the bottom left, you see a little image that is a picture of a palette. And the palette indicates that it's been colorized, it's been changed using an AI system. So this is, a, a, a new convention that's coming into play to tell people that an, that an image has been colorized. And you can see it here on the, on the MyHeritage site as well. So um, yeah, so that, 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 that's one part. I suppose the other thing I would say is that you know, colorization isn't a new thing. This has been happening since 1847, I think. So you know, when the first daguerreotypes were made, people started colorizing them. So you know, we're, we're talking about um, now. I know, obviously, it's becoming uh, you know more realistic. And of course, you know, we know we live in a world where um, there are many things that can be faked. And uh, just as an example of this, I'll show you this website, which is this person does not exist, where basically it randomly generates pictures of people that you know don't exist. So, you know, again, I think anybody looking at these pictures would say, oh, yeah, these are real people, but they are all computer generated based on a bank of images that is trained on and learned on. And, you know, people are using this for nefarious purposes, for creating fake social media accounts, for, you know, scams and so on. So uh, I, I suppose we, we do know that, 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 we, uh, that, that we live in a world where images can be, um, you know, you, you've seen the deep fakes with making politicians uh, talk and so on. But as I say, you know, for the historical photographs, I think most people know that these things weren't a color originally and they, and they, and they have been colorized because they, they are from a particular time. And as I said to you, you know, colorization goes back to um, the, the mid 19th century when you know, people just wanted to see things in color. They wanted to have a more realistic interpretation of, of, of what things may have looked like if they were seen in color. And you know, in the early time, the early days of colorization, sometimes they actually took very detailed records of the colors. So when they took a photograph, they would write down the, the colors that things should have been. And they were kept for when the Colorizers, colorizers went and you know manually um, added colors to photographs. So this is a bit, bit of context there. Um, so yeah, so I can just again go through some of these maybe recent pictures and and tell some stories. Um, obviously, we, we've talked about it on Rossa. This is um, Miles Byrne. Again, you know, we, we don't have any, uh, any any records in terms of uh, eye color and so on. But for a lot of the photographs of people, I suppose just give some ideas of the types of records you could look at. So for example. I would often go to the Liberty Ellis Foundation website, which is they 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 have the records for the Ellis Island um, um, uh, people who, people who basically travel through through Ellis Island. So, like if I type in, um, I'm just going to go to the passenger search here thing, so you can see. And it starts to respond. Start your search. Okay, I'll try this and see. Anyway, you can basically type in a name. So for example, for a while I was looking for Countess Markovich to try and find out what her eye color was. And uh, eventually I found the record but it was spelled differently. So um, it was spelled with V-I-C-H and you can see here Constance Markovich and you can go into the passenger record and I'm just gonna log in. So um, you can click on the ship manifest and then you can click on the image and you can see these are all free, so anyone can, can access these for free. You can just sign up for an account on the on the Liberty Ellis Foundation website. And there's a page which lists the people and there's a page that lists their attributes. So for example, this is Markovich, line 14. You can see nationality, where she was born, uh, contact points, where she was going and so on. So you click on line 14 and then you look at line 14 in the other document and you'll see that she had fair complexion, gray, let me just double check this again. 14, fair complexion, gray hair, and blue eyes. OK, so again, you get, you get records like that to help you with, with the colorization for, 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 for various people. And you know, I found ancestors and uh, lots of people in these records. They're, they're, anybody who's traveled to the US in a certain time frame, they, they can be quite useful. Um, so, you know, so that's, um, you know, this is a picture of, as I say, of, 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 of Miles Byrne. He, you know, we don't have records in terms of eye color, so we're just you know, making a guess. I suppose the one thing is we know that um, a lot of uh, Irish people have, have blue eye color. What you'll find with these systems like the Oldify and, and so on is that they're, used, they're trained on a large set of images. So, you know, you'll get a lot of brown eye colors because brown is the most common eye color in the world, obviously not in Ireland and, and, and the UK, um, I, I think is 
similar to Ireland in terms of, of the blue eye color. So you're, again, you're, 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 you're looking at the photograph. You can tell sometimes about, by looking at the photograph if the eye color is light or dark, you know, you'll know that it's probably blue or brown. Um, again, it won't be maybe 100%, but you can make a best guess based on stats and, and, and so on. Um, there's a picture of the, the weekend of the Cavan team. This is from, um, it's from 1914, I think. Yeah, 1914. Um, so the blue jumpers were, or blue jerseys were fairly straightforward. Um, I found this from the Library of Congress and it was a picture, it was a picture of a game that they played against Leitrim. And um, Leitrim, there's another picture of the Leitrim team. And you know, we know the, the Leitrim colors are green and gold. So I've given that those colors, sometimes green and white, sometimes green and gold. And I've maybe left it a little bit ambiguous here in the background. It could be, could be either. But I found the other picture of the Leitrim team and they've got LYM. I'm not sure what the Y stands for in the middle of Leitrim um, on their jerseys. And then the cabins are obviously spelled out in full C cabin. This guy here then, once I saw the ND, I was pretty sure it was Notre Dame. Um, and I used Notre Dame colors for that jersey. So again, might not be 100% accurate, but it's, it's um, it, it looks realistic. There's still a bit of work to do in this. You can see there's a crack across the glass plate negative that I'm going to have to try and adjust. And I started working on that and got distracted by something else. Um, you know, some of the first color photographs from Ireland were by um, uh, by two French scholars who were sent on a scholarship by Albert Kahn to take photographs of Ireland. And there's lots of pictures of the red shawls in, in the west of Ireland. And you know, I would have, I suppose, been inspired by those for the various pictures from Ireland and so on of, of the red shawls. And there's, again, there are some records of, of types of clothes worn by people in the west of Ireland uh, in, in Dukas, which is the website for the National Folklore Collection. There would be hand-drawn pictures and hand-colored pictures of you know, the men with the indigo jumpers and with the brown um, waistcoat and pants, and then women with red, with red petticoats and so on. So again, we would use those as inspiration for some of those colors. Um, we have Margaret Burke Sheridan or Maggie from Mayo shown here on the left hand side. Um, the auxiliaries. So again, you know, um, there are obviously records in terms of the dark green um, uh, uniforms and the tan uniforms and the combination of those uh, in, in terms of, of what they wore. And both the auxiliaries and, and the, the black and tans were mixtures of those. So um, this is actually the I company of auxiliaries led by Commander Vickers, as far as I remember. Should be, no, it's not here in the text, but anyway, I remember looking this up re recently. And this is in front of um, Amiens Street Station, which is Connolly Station. Lots of nice details in this from the stop press graffiti on the wall to, you know, the numbers of the cars and people in the background and so on. So um, there's always manual choices. So I, again, I would have looked up the various colors of things like these cars. There's another picture from Mount Joy of a Austin armored car or Pyrrhus armored car. I can't remember which one it is. But again, I would have found models and pictures of those and tried to choose the appropriate colors of the wheels, of the car, of the, you know, the, the markings on the side and so on in terms of what they should have looked like. Um, but there's always a bit of artistic interpretation, like the blue sign here. Um, I don't know if that, that was blue or not, but um, there is actually, as it happens, a blue sign in front of, of Connolly Street Station today. So I just uh, happened to, to have that color. Um, this is a picture from uh, a set from a film that was filmed at the same time as Maggie of, sorry, this is this is actually Maggie from Man of Iron, but this is filmed at the same time as Man of Iron. It was called Iha Shannon Keys, which is basically a night of storytelling. And it's known as the first Irish language sound film. And again, for these, I would have used the indigo tops and the brown pants and the red petticoats and so on for the various characters in there. So trying to build on, on records in terms of, of what would have been worn. So um, we have Paddy Clancy and again, uh, the colors of uniforms would be fairly well known. Um, so near JFK and Jackie Onassis, I think this is an earlier version. I would have changed the hair color color in this based on feedback that was too light and I have a newer version of that, which I've sh since shared. Um, this one here, which is broken up into pieces here is a picture from Downing State Street during the negotiations between uh, Griffith um, and De Valera, and then later on, I think Michael Collins was involved with um, Lloyd George. And an interesting thing here, when I was colorizing this photograph, you can see the flag here, which looks like an Ivory Coast flag, but the guy seemed to have been holding the wrong way around. And I just thought maybe I've got it wrong. And I asked a friend who's a colorizer to see if he could see if he thought it was being held the wrong way around. And he 
you know, collaborated with me on that and confirmed that it was. So just a, an interesting uh, picture. But again, you can see a lot of um, different clothes colors here. Again, these are just imagined of what it might be. We can't say, of course, for sure what color clothes they wore. But again, I've I have an array of colors here to make it look more realistic and to have balance across the photograph. Um, you know, people like Grace Kelly and so on. It's very easy to colorize their their um, their 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 pictures because we have lots of pictures. Obviously, she, she was filmed in color, so there's lots of of, of information there. Um, this picture here of uh, Patrick Cavan and Anthony Cronin. You know, I done an initial colorization, and then I, actually I found there was a YouTube video which was filmed. In 1954, and even though um, it was quite early for color film, there was actually color film at the time. There was code code uh, color, I think, was one of the early color films, um, and being used for amateur film. So, I think, and it looks like it, it, it's actually originally in color. And I went and uh, changed the suit for um, Anthony Cronin and his tie and so on to match what was in that color film. So this is a picture from the National Library of Ireland in in Monkstown. Um, so we have Kavanagh and Cronin. And um, yeah, so um, we have Tomas McCurtain. I have a funny feeling I asked a family member what color eyes they thought he had. Um, we have Pat O'Leary, and again, somebody asked me to do this, and I asked them if they knew what eye color he had. I don't know if I got a definitive answer on that. So anyway, we try and do as say as much research into into the people in the photographs as 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 possible. As I say, sometimes it'll be fairly obvious and sometimes you, you've no idea. This is one that I'd like to update at some stage. It's it's from um, Rochestown Monastery. And the most difficult part of this photograph was stained glass behind um, Terence McSweeney here in the background because I had to go and colorize each of these little things, which was a pain to color. Um, and I don't know what the actual colors are. So I, I did send a message to, um, I think the Rochestown school to find out if they had a picture of this um, stained glass door, but anyway, that might be for some time in the future. So we do try and go back and update and change and fix anything that seems like you know it may not be correct or could could be updated in, in, in the future. Um, did some research into again what degree Terence McSweeney graduated with. So again, that's another one. This one here, an interesting photograph. Let me see what version this is. Yeah, I think we have a newer version of this, but basically. It's um, you know it's British soldiers obviously searching for Republicans on, under the train. This is from Kerry, and subsequently somebody said that this was should have been a kind of a burgundy claret color train, which I went back and changed, and that the chevrons on this guy's um, arm would have been uh, for good service, and they were typically blue and red. And you know I, I would have updated those colors appropriately, but then the helmets and, and the, the uniforms and, and all that, they're okay. They're all World War I uniforms. They had these kind of greenish um, type helmets. So again, we looked, looked at photographs a period where to go back and, and update the colors for these. Um, so yeah, it kind of gives you a good snapshot of, 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 uh, of different images. Um, this one was recently recolored by a friend of mine, Matt Lockery for RTE, and he correctly spotted that there is a Kilkenny player in the background here. So again, I've I've gone back and updated my own version of this image here. So you can see the, the Dublin players, which it's easy enough in terms of the blue tops, but there's a Kilkenny player there in the background. And I think there's another one over here. And actually when I zoomed in the closer, you can't really see it very well here, but you can actually see the writing Kilkenny on the front of this guy's um, uniform. So you can see the IL and the NY. So again, I would have gone back and added um, added some stripes, some some yellow stripes to that as well. So, you know, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating how much detail is, is, is uh, is in these photographs. The Oscar Wilde ones, again, I will have found various records of his tours in the, in the US. And I have a big document of um, the types of clothes he wore, you know, for, ranging from the coats to the cravats to the shoes with the silver buckles, um, red stockings, you know. So each of those things I would try and incorporate if we have the information in, into the images. Um, the Republicans in Grafton Street, you know, this is just kind of an assortment really of clothes there. Um, so there, you know, there is a, there is artistic interpretation in, in many of these, but then as I say, you try and find any facts, like whether it's you know Michael Collins's hazel eyes or um, you know some of these pictures. Actually, family members would have contacted afterwards with the correct colors for different things. So you know that's that's great when that happens as well. Okay, so that's a. Uh, that's a run through some of the, the, the backstories, I suppose, for some of these. This little chap here is, is um, 
from the 1930s is uh, Keen O'Carroll. He's, um, he's, he's, uh, he, he contacted us actually. Um, so we were in touch with Keen and his family. And, uh, you know, he was, I think, um, I can't remember, did he say he was six maybe when this photograph was taken? And he, he's, uh, he's from Limerick. So it's nice to hear as well from people who are um, in these photographs as well, or, 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 or their family as well. So I want to leave some time for questions as well, because I know we only have 10 minutes left and want to hopefully answer any questions you may have. So if anyone has any questions, they can unmute themselves now and they can uh, ask John a question. I've, I've won just to get the ball rolling, uh, John. Uh, what was your motivation for the book? Was that always part of your plans? And was it uh, amazing success? Was that a surprise or were you expecting it to be as popular as it turned out to be? Um, so it was never, it, it wasn't always part of the plans, I suppose, is, is the first answer, you know, I, so I started colorizing photographs, I think it was May last year when I started doing, you know, a couple of, of, uh, of Galway and so on. And on my own social media channels, they became quite popular and around, uh, I think it was the end of August, I set up this old Ireland color brand, if you want to call it that. But really it was only around... March when I suppose when lockdown happened that and you know people have mentioned books and so on and, and, and I've done an initial experiment I don't know if I have it here but I printed out a, an album of photographs because I was due to give an exhibition of Galway photographs in the museum later this year which would have been right now and I printed out a, a, a kind of a photo book of, of some of the pictures I was going to use so but I didn't really think we would do a formal book. And I was really, uh, I, had a, I had a good chat with, with a friend of mine, uh, Matt Lockery, who's uh, from My Colourful Past. He's a colorizer based in Mayo. In, I think it was in early March or maybe maybe the end of February. And we talked about, or I talked about maybe maybe doing a calendar. And at that stage, I think that was all really I was kind of uh, thinking about. Um, but I suppose with lockdown, and I actually, I, I was sick for a couple of weeks myself. I. I was kind of uh, self-isolating and um, a few people just mentioned the book. So I think at some point in time, a guy I know in, in, in the UK said, you know, he, and he mentioned this book, The Colour of Time from Marina Amaral, which I, I'd, I'd heard of her. I didn't, I didn't realise there was a book, but um, I, I'd seen her pictures of the colorizations from Auschwitz and how powerful they were. And uh, he, he suggested, you know, it'd be great if you teamed up with a historian like they did for that book. And I'm waving off to my side here because I have a copy of the book over here as well. Um, and I just approached a colleague of mine, Yanyoi Galway, Sarah Ann Buckley, who was absolutely fantastic. Um, funny thing is we'd never met. So Sarah Ann and I still haven't met because <laughs> we've been <laughs> we've been working on this virtually. So um, it's a real product. So, um, it's a real product of COVID. And uh, we haven't met our publishers in person. We haven't met in, in, in person ourselves. So it, it's, it's been, um, but it's worked out really well. So, you know, Sarah Ann's speciality is, is 19th to 20th century, but also the history of children. And, you know, we just uh, worked very well together. So, yeah, so, I, I, and in terms of popularity, uh, you know, I kind of thought, obviously we knew that the social media was moderately popular. And I guess we probably hoped that maybe the same amount of people might like the book, but, um, I think it's definitely exceeded ex expectations. So hello, John. Hello. Hi, who's this? Hello, Hi. Uh, John O'Loughlin. John O'Loughlin. Um, I'm having trouble with. Good, thank you. And great presentation, John. Thank you. Very interesting. I, I'm having a little trouble with my my um, uh, microphone and camera. Oh, but anyhow, fine, um, I have some old pictures some old school pictures and um i i might try the uh, the oldify yeah technique like, on them what i would do john is i, I would try you know try this uh my heritage in color as i said you get 10 photographs for free and you know it, it does put a logo in the bottom right but i think just to get a feel for kind of what it does it's um it, you know, it, it, it's a good um, it's a good test to see kind of how how good it gets. There is a free version which I mentioned. You know, the, the one I've done the tutorial for. Uh, this picture didn't come out great, but yeah. to be honest, most of them do come out um, a, a lot better than this. And I think this is probably just a bad example. Sometimes it depends on the quality of the image. It depends on you know how big they are and the resolution and so on. But certainly, if you want yes. to get some good results, like this is the one. This is kind of my go-to one. And then the colorized image is, is very good as well. I, I use that quite a lot. I, my I, heritage. I, 
Yeah, my heritage uh, yeah. in color. Just Google for my heritage in color. You'll 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 find it to be the first color. thing that comes up. I've just typed it there in to, to prove yeah. it. Yeah. John, yes. um, did you would you take uh, Tommy? Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Very very You're welcome. Interesting. Um, Is this my brother does a lot of, I've done a little bit in the past, my brother does more than I do. Thank you, John. Oh, you're welcome, John. Thanks. Sorry, I missed your name. Who's your, what's your name there? The... Tommy. Um, How are you? How are you doing, John? Thanks for the presentation. Very you're good. welcome. Um, I just want to ask you, like, I've done a little bit of family research and we have a lot of old photographs as well. So yeah. Do you, what do we need to do? Do we need to take a screenshot and upload it onto that? Yeah, so you would need to scan it in now, you know, there are many apps you can do for, for doing this. And I've forgotten, I know there's a Google um, photo scanner and I, I don't use it, so I can't remember the name of it. It is, it's, it's called, it's like uh, Ron Seal, it does what it says in 10. It's called PhotoScan by Google. And you can basically take pictures of old photographs using that and, and scan them in. Um, and then you can basically upload it to the, you know, to one of these sites like Myra Heritage, or you can get the app, colorized images or, you know, or, or, or both. So yeah, photo scan, I suppose, will be one. If, if you don't have a scanner, like I have um, behind me here, I have, a, I have a big black box, which is a, you know, it's a high resolution photograph scanner. And um, I would push various, you know, negatives or glass plate negatives onto that and, you know, get a, a, a professional level scan. But I think for doing family photographs, you know, these apps like PhotoScan and so on should do what you need. And, you know, you just hold it up, take a picture and it'll auto correct and, and, uh, and, and adjust and so on. So that would be a good starting point. Yeah, the one, the one of Donovan Rossa is very, very good because I've seen photographs of Donovan Rossa when he was old and not old, you know, with the grey beard and all that, you know. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and you know, again, the I suppose the, the quality is kind of very. Like I looked up, uh, and you'll see it, it's here in, in Wikipedia. The picture here of Donovan Rossa. I don't know where it, where it came from. It's you know, it's a low quality one, so. Um, it, it depends, I suppose, where it comes from. Depends what it's scanned from. Is it, if it's from a newspaper, if it's from a book, or whatever. But if it's family photograph, you'll probably get better quality than that particular one, anyway. Well, Donovan Ross was a very interesting man, very interesting character. Well, again, I, as I say to you, I'm I'm largely ignorant of 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 many, uh, and I, I have to say this, you know, like I I I've learned a lot really in, in the past uh, year or so, and even you know, I didn't realize that he had actually met uh, O'Connell at the age of twelve. He shook his hand and. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the events of, of the years afterwards were, were, um, were hugely um, transformational in terms of, of his attitude and, you know, so, but yeah, I, I learned a lot in terms of, of him and, and, and interestingly, actually some of his, uh, I think great, his, I'm sure his great grandchildren or great, great grandchildren have, have emerged on social media today. Um, I mean, surely loads of children, loads and loads of children. So. 11 or 12, I think, yeah. So, yeah, um, I mean, he's bound to have a lot of ants uh, in the sentence, you know. So any other questions? Oh. No. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. That was great, John. Uh, just to say thanks a million for joining us this evening. Uh, well done in the publication, well done in the presentation. Best of luck uh, with the book. Have, have you any other projects planned uh, in, in terms of, are there any new developments in terms of uh, technology coming that you're going to be involved in? Um, in terms of technology, I, 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 so I, I have some students working on this at the moment, trying to see if we can get a better model based on Irish photographs, because you know the, these, these models are trained based on you know images from all around the world. And I'm trying to see if we can nudge things in, in in a you know in a direction to get um maybe more irish colors from 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 these systems that's something that's that, that we're working on at the moment but in general you know i, I think the, the amazing thing is there's so much fantastic source material out there i have my own uh personal archive which i've it's called the resin archive and um i'm starting to you know gather photographs myself that I've, I've bought and i'm i'm uh, I, I'm making those available online as well, and you know I've, I've colorized some of these as well. So um, I, I'm interested, I suppose, in in preserving, I suppose, as much of this in the original form, um, as well as seeing what can be brought to life through color. So I, I think there's there's a place for both, you know, and um, like as a you know, it, it's important to be able to um, see the source for all of these photographs. 
and to to understand that you know you can get to these sources no matter what and i think the other thing is that the colorizations do draw you to much broader source of black and white source material there's no way we'd be able to colorize all the images in 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 in, in the best format but let's say for example O'Donnell Rossa, who some may know of and others may not know of it'll i think cause people to go and find out more about that person and that's uh, i think part of the aim of the project as well well thank you john and and thanks again for joining us a uh, very you. informative thanks, evening really enjoyed it and best of luck thank you thanks